Hi, everyone. My name is Michael Simon, and I'm the Executive Director of Northwestern Hillel. It's my honor to welcome you to the special speaker event featuring Maggie Haberman in conversation with Dean Charles Whitaker. In a moment, we'll introduce Maggie and Charles, but I first want to share a few words about Hillel and to extend some thank yous. Hillel is the center of Jewish life at this great university and the catalyst of Jewish expression of all kinds. At Hillel, we work to inspire Jewish students to make a meaningful and enduring commitment to Jewish life, and we enrich the lives of students so that they may enrich the campus, the Jewish community, and the world. A challenge we embrace is helping students to connect the relevance of their particular Jewish identity to their complex overall identities and their role as citizens in an interconnected, globalized world. One way we do this is through campus-wide initiatives that foster diversity, inclusion, and civic engagement. Today's event is an example of this, and we are so grateful to our partner institutions and co-sponsors, <clears throat> the Office of the President, the Contemporary Thought Speaker Series, and of course, our hosts in this great space, Medill. I also want to express my appreciation to the Jewish Federation of Metropolitan Chicago for its tremendous partnership and support of everything we do. Kudos to the staff and students who helped to make not just this event possible, but who create all of Hillel's great programming and initiatives. Specific thanks tonight to Hillel's Director of Engagement, Natalie Debo, and to our student assistant on this program, Eden Lichterman. Yeah, they, they deserve a... <laughs> Special thanks to the Hillel Board of Directors and extra special appreciation to the Jordan and Jean Nirenberg Family Foundation for their visionary support of this event now in its fourth year. And Julie Nirenberg is here, so hello, welcome. <clears throat> and last thanks to you, students, faculty, community members, and friends for joining us. When Jordan and Jean first floated the idea for a speaker event with me, they hoped we would bring speakers who would inspire students to address complex questions about the world through rigorous and clear-eyed inquiry. We are tremendously fortunate to have both Maggie, a courageous journalist reporting from the room where it happens, and Charles, a path-breaking journalist, professor, and institutional visionary, speaking tonight about key issues of the day. <laughs> from the outside, it looks like it. <laughs> For me, the connection between Medill and Hillel runs deeper than just co-sponsoring great events like this. At Hillel, we have pens that say, write your story, because we encourage students to author their own story and to see their personal story as part of the multi-layered, centuries-old narrative and narratives that comprise the story of the Jewish people. Next weekend at Hillel and all around campus and in millions of homes around the world, Jews will celebrate Passover with seders, in which we tell the story of liberation from slavery in Egypt. Yes, this is the shameless plug. If you haven't signed up, go to Hillel northwesternhillel.org and sign up for seders. But the point is, we're reminded at the seder that behold dor vador, in every generation, each person is obligated to see themselves as though they actually went out from Egypt. We do this by retelling an age-old story, making that story relevant and meaningful for ourselves in this time, and planting new seeds of meaning that will resonate into the future. This, it seems to me, is also the work of great journalists, telling stories that help us make sense of our world and that inspire us to meaningful action. I am thrilled that we have Maggie and Charles, two speakers who are exemplars of this work, to help us explore the significance of telling today's most important stories. And I am delighted in this work, to work with student leaders who inspire their peers to develop aspects of their Jewish identity while figuring out who they are and who they want to become. Often, those student leaders do that work through stories. Sometimes, those student leaders are also incredibly adept at real-life journalism. One such student leader, Hillel's student president in 2017-18 is now a Report for America Corps member at the Telegraph in Macon, Georgia. But tonight she's here to introduce our speakers. So please join me in welcoming back our beloved alumna, Samantha Max. Hi, everyone. 
again. Uh, thank you, Michael, for inviting me to the event today. After 10 months in the Deep South, I'm thrilled to be back in Evanston to introduce two people who have truly inspired me as a young journalist. Charles Whitaker, our moderator tonight, was my professor my junior year, and his class taught me more about the magazine industry than some avid readers may learn in a lifetime. It's not an exaggeration to say Professor Whitaker is a leader in the field. He's even co-authored uh, co a textbook on the subject. Before joining the Medill faculty, he served as senior editor of Ebony Magazine. Whitaker started his career at the Miami Herald, reporting on education and local government. He then worked at the Louisville Times, serving as deputy feature editor and enterprise features and arts writer. Whitaker has won numerous awards from organizations like the National Association of Black Journalists, the Society of Professional Journalists, and the National Education Writers Association. Whitaker has filled multiple roles during his time at Medill, teaching courses in news writing, magazine writing, and magazine editing, and also teaches at Medill's High School Summer Institute. He now serves as interim dean and a professor at the journalism school. Our main speaker tonight probably needs no introduction, but I'll do my best to paint a picture of this world-renowned journalist. I'm gonna start off by fessing up to the fact that I'm a bit of a stalker. This actually is not the first time I've stood feet for Maggie Haberman, though she might not know that. Um, on November 4th, I was covering a Trump rally in Macon, Georgia, just days before a nail-biting gubernatorial election that left the state without a clear winner for 10 days. In a sea of MAGA hats and national reporters who had descended onto the small southern town where I've been working at the local newspaper, newspaper for the last 10 months, I spotted the New York Times White House correspondent and being the journalism nerd that I am, immediately wanted to say hi. Um, my colleague from the local public radio station quickly stopped me. He said it wouldn't be cool. Um, <laughs> but I'm so grateful for the opportunity to formally introduce this Pulitzer Prize winning reporter to all of you. Since 2015, Haberman has tirelessly followed every twist and turn of Donald Trump's campaign and presidency as a political reporter for the New York Times. In 2018, she was part of the team that won a Pulitzer Prize for the Times' illuminating reporting on Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election. Before that, the Sarah Lawrence graduate worked her way up from stints covering City Hall at the New York Post and New York Daily News to the role of senior reporter at Politico. In 2017, Haberman co-reported a riveting account of President Trump's nightly routine, bringing readers into the dimly lit West, Link, West Wing and Halls of Mar-a-Lago with vivid descriptions of the Commander-in-Chief angrily tweeting about the travel ban and watching TV in a bathrobe. It's clear from Haberman's reporting that she's built a deep trust with her sources, something I can't imagine has been easy to do as the President of the United States has routinely referred to the New York Times as the enemy of the people and a failing newspaper. In an interview on the Long Form podcast, Haberman said the past few years have felt like one long day. She had her laptop open throughout the interview, tweeting and emailing back and forth with editors as news broke in the Paul Manafort case. If you've seen Showtime's miniseries about the New York Times coverage of Trump's presidency, The Fourth Estate, you know that work never stops for Haberman. She told Long Form, if I start thinking about it, then I'm not going to be able to do my job. I'm being as honest as I can. I try not to think about it. If you're flying a plane and you think about the fact that if the plane blows up in midair, you're going to die, do you feel like you can really focus as well? This is just my job. This is what we do. Thank you, Maggie Haberman, for doing what you do and for taking a bit of your limited free time to be here with us tonight. You provide an invaluable service to this democracy, and we're lucky to have you. for that. That was a wonderful introduction, really. Um, so our format today, Maggie and I are going to talk just a little bit, but I know you guys have a ton of questions, so I'm going to throw it to you as quickly as possible. Um, but we'll do a little back and forth, um, and then, yeah, we'll, we'll take it from there. Maggie, thank you so much for joining us. As you can see from the SRO crowd, we are very excited and honored to have you here. Uh, I think my first question, for the sake of our young journalists here, is um, how does one become Maggie Haberman? Uh, um, you, 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 both of your parents are in media, your dad, uh, Clyde Haberman was a longtime New York Times reporter. Your mother uh, was in communications and public relations. Did that encourage or discourage you about going into journalism? 
Both. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for having me. And Sam, that introduction was overwhelming, and you should have come and said hello, because that would have been very cool. Um, but I, I can't live up to everything you just set up there, so I'll, I'll do my best uh, for the next hour and a half. Um, so uh, I did not want to be a journalist. I, um, my parents were divorced when I was young. My father was a foreign correspondent for The Times for 12 years. We would go visit him, my brother and me. Uh, for a few months of every year, and I, you know, he never stopped working. It was, even when we would go to visit him, he would never stop working, and so I was acutely aware of the impact that this profession has on your family, and swore I'd never do that, and uh, that worked well. Um, but uh, when I, I went to college uh, and studied fiction writing at Sarah Lawrence, Sarah Lawrence which was a, a long-running joke when I went to go work for the New York Post. Um, not fair one, but it was a long-running joke. And uh, when I was in college, uh, you know, the only thing I ever wanted to do was be a writer. And it was a very, fiction writing is a very different type of writing than news writing, as you know. Um, so I tried getting a job at magazines, mostly women's magazines, although I, I feel like I did have an interview at Newsweek at one point. I was shot down by every single one, and there was one after the other. Um, but had you been writing for the school paper? Or I hadn't. I literally, I took one journalism class, and it was eleventh grade, um, <laughs> and um, and it didn't it didn't it didn't stay with me that that long. Um, and I I found out through a family friend about a uh, a job as a copy kid as a clerk at the New York Post after I graduated, and I I went to work there, and it was like fifty dollars a day, and it was it's not a glamorous job being a copy kid. You're running page proofs around and faxes and you're being called, you know, screamed copy by editors at the top of their lungs. And by day two, I was just hooked on the newsroom. It was just incredible in the 1990s to be in a New York newsroom. Um, there was this incredible tabloid war between the Post and the Daily News, yeah. and um, the rhythms and the pace and uh, the adrenaline rush of, of filing your story on deadline and having it get edited and watching people have scoops and... Once a week, uh, copy kids, if they wanted to, were sent out as general assignment reporters. And so I, you know, gleefully took that on. And uh, I remember paying for my own beeper because they wouldn't give me one at that point. I don't think anybody has beepers anymore, but this was, this was pre-cell phones, how, how desks would get in touch with you. And a, a colleague, a, a full-time reporter had said to, it was a general assignment reporter, uh, said, get a beeper, it'll pay for itself. You know, they'll call you when they need an extra reporter. And it did. And um, that's how it happened. How did you graduate to the City Hall beat? Because soon you're covering Rudy Giuliani. So 19, August 1996 is when I started at The Post. Um, and I was, I was this sort of half clerk, half reporter for two years. Um, I was farmed out to Jack Newfield, who was a famous muckraking journalist from the Village Voice at the time, worked at the Post by then. And I helped him on um, projects that he was doing about cronyism in Brooklyn in the surrogates courts. And then we did a, a list of 10 worst judges in New York City together. And he had mastered this form of accountability journalism at the Village Voice, and he brought it over to the Post. Um, and I was interested in City Hall. My father had covered City Hall. Um, and uh, the Metro editor at the Post, a guy named Stuart Marks, sent me down there in 99. I knew nothing. I mean, I, I still remember being extremely wide-eyed and overwhelmed by everything. And Giuliani was in his, I think, second year of his, of his second term. Yeah, and um, his State of the City speech was that month when I was first down there. And it was when he was threatening to, quote unquote, blow up the Board of Education. Um, and that was, you know, there, there's, there are some kernels of what I cover now, right, um, related to that. Um, but I, I loved City Hall, and Giuliani's relationship with the media was, you know, dramatic and intense. His relationship with the Times was not completely dissimilar from Donald Trump's. Um, but Giuliani was, he was, you know, he, he had, race relations were, were notoriously bad under him. Um, uh, and there were some really egregious uh, incidents of police brutality. He was also a transformative mayor in, in the city, just in terms of crime going down. And so it was covering those dualities. Um, and I stayed there until uh, 2001. I covered Mike Bloomberg's campaign. And I was so angry 
that I was assigned to cover it because I was like, he's the he's the joke candidate. He's not going to win. Well, the, the echoes of that to now as well. You you yeah. cover another billionaire who decides yep. that he yeah. wants to be a politician and yeah. who everyone said would not That's not right. win, um, and uh, my, myself included at various points. And uh, and Bloomberg obviously won after after September 11th, 2001. The landscape politically in New York City changed dramatically. Giuliani's endorsement was suddenly very valuable. It had not been before that. Uh, and Bloomberg won, and so I was kept on at City Hall because I had covered the campaign, and much as I was kept on at the White House because I had covered the campaign. Um, and I covered rebuilding at the Trade Center for a couple of years. Um, and uh, that was, I'd say just in terms of uh, intensity, probably the most similar to what this beat is in terms of pace and volume. So that's how I ended up there. You've been at all the major dailies in New York. Except What's Newsday. The, except That's Newsday. the one I wasn't That's at. Right. Yeah. What, what are the similarities and differences there? That's a great question. Uh, when I first got to City Hall, the New York Times very uh, rigorously covered New York City. And I don't think we cover New York City the, the way we used to. And I think it's, it's uh, too bad. Um, the New York Post uh, has a very strong uh, sense of what it is and what it isn't. Uh, the Daily News was often referred to as a tabloid in a tutu, and it because it was unsure of what it sort of wanted to be. Um, the editor who hired me at the Daily News said to me, you know, the, the, the Post wants to be first, the Times wants to be right, we have to be first and right, and you should just want to be right in general. But, um, but, uh, but the Daily News was, you know, it had always been this, uh, it had been a working class paper and it, it uh, had a huge readership in the outer boroughs and it had struggled with um, strikes and changes in, in ownership and it was still sort of figuring out what it was at that point. Um, whereas the Post had this very hard edge and the Post was almost in a resurgence when Giuliani became mayor. He was the first Republican mayor in a long time. The Post had a, an, an unapologetically uh, conservative editorial page uh, and conservative owner, Rupert Murdoch. Um, the Times does not cover, as I said, the city uh, the same way. I, I have this very vivid memory of a now columnist named Dan Barry, who was the bureau chief at City Hall when I first got there for the Times. And I remember listening to Dan on the phone with what I, I think it was one of the lawyers for Giuliani during Giuliani's divorce from his second wife, which played out across the papers. And the lawyer was trying to go off the record and I could only hear Dan's side of the conversation, but in the press room at City Hall, we all sat on top of each other. And so, you know, the New York Post would be right here, and Dan's desk was literally over there. And I heard him saying, no, I will not take that off the record. No, I will not take that off the record. What do you mean, why? And then there was a pause, and it was because it's information that exists just to torture me. Um, and that always stayed with me. Uh, and it, But it was, they were, they were on top of it. They were deeply involved in city coverage. Um, and it's, I don't think New York has been immune from the what has happened with a lot of munis municipalities or state houses with local coverage, where it's just not quite the same. Right. Fast forwarding, I'm gonna hop over your stint at Politico. You come to the Times in 2015 to cover the campaign. The campaign is in full swing. Trump is not being taken that seriously initially. What did the national media miss that uh, we should have known uh, at that time? What? Yeah, I, I mean, it's a, it, we we still talk about this, right? I mean, the the a lot, and we talk about this internally um, uh, among ourselves. Look, the I think that all of us in the national media were the collective we. I don't think every single person was doing it, but the collective we were covering the GOP primary based on sort of how elites thought it should be. So under that definition, it was that Jeb Bush was surging. And what Jeb Bush had was name ID and a lot of money, but he was never ahead in the polls. I don't think he was ever out of single digits, and if he was, it was barely. Um, we missed two things. One was just that Trump was really striking a nerve with people. Um, there was a rally that he did in Mobile, Alabama in August of 2015, where he got 20,000 people. That isn't just celebrity, um, that's part of it, but I think that we were not quite paying attention. Um, and I think we missed the fact that he had been part of the cultural, the pop culture fabric for 30 years, and that specifically a lot of voters came to know him through The Apprentice. And the view of Donald Trump 
that we had in New York City in the five bur from the five borough view was very different than the rest of the country had. And because so much of the media was based in the Acela corridor, you know, we were used to covering him as somebody with multiple bankruptcies and, you know, who had stopped really doing major building projects a while ago and mostly was in, in the licensing business. And they saw him as this sort of larger than life innovator. Um, it's sitting in the leather back chair. Roger Stone, whose name I imagine is probably familiar to some of you, who was a who's Trump's longest serving on and off advisor, had said to me at one point during the campaign that we all didn't understand that the line between news and entertainment really was blurred for most viewers uh, in a way it obviously wasn't for us. And that was true. So I remember in January of 2016 going to a uh, Trump rally in Iowa. I forget which city, but it was maybe a week before the caucuses. And I asked questions like, are you, you know, are you coming here just because it's you think it might be the last time to see him? And people would say, no, I'm caucusing for him. And they would look at me like I had eight heads. And I'd say, why? And they'd say, I, I watched him on TV. I think you know he's a strong businessman. And it should have been clearer to us that there was a disconnect. How much do you think race factored into the appeal? Um, I think that race uh, unquestionably factored into the appeal. Uh, I don't know how to how to gauge that in terms of the percentage, um, but he certainly uh, tapped into a group of voters who uh, were were white, were working class, and who felt as if the country was slipping away from them. Um, when you combine that with uh, the the anti-immigrant comments that were really not just about um, about uh, South and Central American immigrants, but were about uh, Muslims, and that was really the driving force for a lot of what we saw in November, December, and into into you know the spring. Um, you know, he talks about that less now, but it was a it was a tie that was binding, and and I think all of that played a factor. You, you move from the campaign into covering the the White House. You, you're still a very young woman, but your career <laughs> <laughs> has. A, I, don't, don't laugh. Your career uh, hits its peak at a time when the digital disruption changes the way, completely the way we operate. I was really antediluvian and covered beats <laughs> back <laughs> when there were still landlines. Um, how has social media, the 24-hour news cycle, changed your life and changed the way you cover politics? Um. Well, <laughs> that does go back to my time at Politico, honestly. Um, there was a, it's funny, I had an editor at The Post who I also worked for at Politico um, for a time. He's at NBC now. But he uh, he was the one who pounded into me just kind of the don't get beat, don't get beat ethos. And, but that was pre, it was, you know, the internet was fairly, you know, uh, prevalent at that point. It was 2001. But, um, and it had changed the way we were doing business, but not completely. Um, it was when I got to Politico that it became constant. Um, and I, I had a, um, actually don't normally talk about this, but I had a, my younger son, my youngest son was born with a health thing and I was, and he's fine now, but I was up at midnight dealing with a medicine for him in the middle of uh, uh, 2011, I guess it was March or April. And I happened to get an email from a source who's, who forwarded me an email, and the source said, I don't know what this means. And what the email was was an email that had just gone out from an aide to Mitch Daniels, who was then the governor of Indiana, who had been seen as the possible you know, uh, large figure in the primary at that point for 2012. And Mitch Daniels had decided he wasn't running. And because I was awake, we got this story up very quickly, and we were all up working until 3 o'clock. Um, but that was, I'd say, my my sort of initiation into what this was all gonna be like going forward. Um, I have to take forced breaks. 20 minutes feels like a long time to be off my phone. Um, it's, it's not ideal and it's probably not very healthy. Uh, it is important for all of us to step back and, and remember two things. One is just that if you're like this, you're probably missing a fair amount and also that Twitter is not real life and most people are not on Twitter. What's your day to day like? What's, what is coverage like? Um, so it begins at about 8.30 in the morning with a bunch of phone calls right after I drop my kids at school. And then um, you know, I either go to the office or I work from home or I work out of a coffee shop. Uh, when I'm in New York, when I'm in DC, I work out of the bureau. And the bureau is uh, a block and a half from the White House. Uh, 
And it's just constant. I mean, it's just constant phone calls, inputs, conversations. Um, you know, I, I think that I asked a former White House aide once, uh, what's the thing that people don't understand about the president? And this person said that the degree to which he still, even as president, has the need to keep himself in the news, as opposed to just sort of naturally being in the news as the leader of the free world. Um, <laughs> and so because of that, you know, he loves to do things like tweet and watch us all chase it. And I think that there has been a pacing issue where people have finally realized that you don't actually have to cover every tweet as if it's news. And you, like the 19th witch hunt tweet is probably not that newsworthy. Um, but, uh, but it's just constant and we're all just still kind of modulated. How do you balance, and I, mean, I know a lot of young people too as they're considering whether or not to do this, enter this business, how do you balance the family? You've got three kids. Yeah, it's hard. It, it's hard, I mean there's no, I don't have a great answer for it. I, I probably don't, my children would probably tell you I don't balance it that well. Um, I, uh, I try to be there as much as possible. I took a much later plane today than I had planned on because I was trying to attend something at my daughter's school. Um, you know, it's hard. It's the, the last two years have been um, more intense than I had anticipated. Your kids are how old? Uh, Thirteen, turning ten, and eight. And are they acutely aware of? Oh yes, what especially the thirteen-year-old. Um, yeah, there was a um, I, the White House Correspondents Association last year. I had the I had the honor of winning um, the Aldo Beckman Award, and I didn't get to attend because of a death in the family, but. Um, there was some video that the Comedy Central people did of Donald Trump's voice singing my name, and my children play it for me all the time, um, <laughs> and they think it's awesome. Um, but uh, but it's you know it's there's stuff that they find interesting about my job. But my my eldest in particular, who's very smart um, and very deeply aware of everything that's going on and reads a lot of news, uh, uh, I think struggles with some of this. So talking about Donald Trump saying your name. One of the curious things about this president is that while he's clearly very hostile about the press, calls us fake news, um, the press except for Fox, that is. Um, he still, literally makes an exception for them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You guys are great. He clearly craves the adoration and adulation. He re the thing that seems to make him most mad is the fact that he doesn't have that. Can you explain that and how does, how does that yeah, I mean, it's look. It's I think one of the things that's confounding to a lot of people is that it's hard to understand the degree to which he's playing a game, uh, to some extent, with this enemy of the people cry, um, and he refuses to hear that it's it's um, dangerous, which is something that our publisher at the Times has said to his face uh, in the Oval Office. Um, the New York Times, in particular, represents for him, I think, the elites who did not approve of him when he was an outer borough developer trying to move into Manhattan. Um, and he just sees the world in terms of press coverage. He always has. I mean, it's just, it's the, it's the, it's a lifeblood. It's an oxygen and it's, and he turned himself in New York into a commodity between the two tabloids. Um, the Daily News less so. When, when Pete Hamill um, uh, was running the Daily News, he tried to put a, a level, I don't know if it was a full moratorium, but he tried to stop a fair amount of the Donald Trump coverage. Um, and he would complain that the, the source close to Donald Trump was invariably Donald Trump, and he didn't like that. Um, but Trump is very good at, at putting himself in the center and knows what will resonate uh, with certain sections of the media. He just fundamentally doesn't understand the concept of a government-focused press corps that's there to cover the White House and not him personally. And... Uh, you know, he, he, there's, for those who haven't listened to it, I'd really urge you to listen to, there was an episode of the Daily Podcast um, from this interview that uh, my colleague Peter Baker and I did that A.G. Salzberger, the publisher, sat in on. Um, we were there because of age. It's complicated anyway, but I would just urge you to listen to it because there's like a 25-minute back and forth between the president and A.G. about coverage, and A.G. is trying to have this conversation where he's saying, you're calling journalists the enemy of the people and that's hugely dangerous and your words are being used by, by dictators and authoritarians around the world um, to crack down on the free press and the president is saying, why can't you guys cover me nicely? And literally, these are the, these are the simultaneous conversations. But that's just how he sees it. It's all up, down, good, bad, referendum on him. Speaking of the, the danger of that, however, 
are you feeling that? Surely, do, what is, what sort of sorts of email do you get? Do you get hate mail? Do you read it? Do you? How does it affect you? There are occasionally some readers who email me hate mail where I can't resist responding, and <laughs> sometimes do, and that's not probably the best posture. Um, what do you remember? Is there one in particular you remember? Yes, and I don't feel, I don't feel at liberty to okay. say it. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes I'll, you know, I'll write back smart take or something like that. But um, I, um, I, I, and then they, and then like, they want to keep going, and then it's weird, because for some of them who come out that way, then they want to have like a conversation. Others, not so much, and you can, you can generally tell. Um, yeah, I, I, I try to tune it out. I mean, I do want to hear legitimate on the level criticism. Um, what I don't want to hear is, you know, um, is slurs over and over again. Um, you know, there's obviously, you've seen that there have been attacks on reporters. Um, I don't know that I can tie at least some of them to the president directly. You know, the, the, the Capitol Gazette shootings, for instance, that was a guy who had a long running uh, feud with the paper, but does it help when the president is is engaging in this rhetoric? No, it does not. Do you feel personally under attack? Well, he's attacked me by name, so well, in that respect, I feel personally attacked. But um, I meant at but, large, not oh, at like large. No, I mean, no, I no, I don't. I mean, I just yeah. think that I don't. I think that there are a lot of people who. I think one of the things we discovered in 2016, taking taking aside so just sort of the more over attacks, but just in terms of criticism. One of the things we discovered in 2016 was we all operated under this impression that people really understand how journalists do their jobs, and that was a mistake on our part. And so I think that we have all tried to make more of an effort through The Daily, the podcast, or through The Fourth Estate, the documentary, um, to show our process and, and how we do what we do to the extent that we can. One of the most amazing things, among the many amazing things about your reporting um, is the depth of the information that you get from out, out of this lighthouse. The leaks are just astounding. <laughs> um, how, do you, how, how do you ingratiate yourselves to them? Where do they, they, they come from? And you know, why is this administration such a leaky ship? It's a, it's a pretty leaky ship. Um, <laughs> I, uh, and it's funny because every new person who comes in likes to say, new, per, new administration official, oh, the leaks are much better now that I'm here. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think initially you had this, you had a lot of people working there who had never met Donald Trump before. And I think they were a little perplexed by the environment that he creates. And so it was almost like therapy. You know, they would, like I would get these 11 o'clock at night texts from administration officials saying like, can you explain what X, Y, Z means when the president says this? Or, um, I think that some of them do it because they're afraid of getting written out of history. I mean, one of the most amazing things about this president is the number of people who have written contemporaneous memos about their conversations with him or in the case of Michael Cohen, were taping um, because they know that he will say, you know, you didn't exist, you weren't really there, this didn't happen this way. And so I think that's part of why people are leaking. Now sometimes there's malevolence to it and people are leaking because they're trying to knife some other faction. And one of the constants of Donald Trump, going back to his business, is that he likes having rival teams competing. Um, and it can get intense. You're gonna tell us who Anonymous is? I don't know who Anonymous is, but if I did, I still wouldn't tell you. But I really do not know, I swear, I really have no idea. How many people know who Anonymous is? I don't think that many. Really? Yeah, but I actually have not made an effort to learn. Not my, not my, not my, not my side of the building. This president has, um, uh, to be generous, an, a, a strained relationship with the truth, um, and <laughs> casual. <laughs> casual, yeah. Um, and sometimes it's bizarre. It's things that are so easily checkable. My father was born in Germany. Um, do you have a sense of where this predilection for, you know, obfuscation, so we say, comes from? And, and, and why can't we as the press just call them lies? I mean, why, are, why do we tiptoe around that? Why don't we just say the president is lying? Well, so let me take that in two parts. Sure. One is in terms of why, why he does it. I mean, he has always said things are, are, are a certain way when they're not true. He has always said things about his wealth that were not true. 
his penthouse in Trump Tower is actually on the 58th floor. He says it's the 66th. I don't know why. Like the elevator goes to 66. Um, and so, you know, it's like how some buildings skip 13. This one skips eight floors. But so, um, he, this is, all, you know, he's been known for this throughout his career. Um, the stuff about the father, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know why he's doing it. Um, I, I could speculate, but it's just speculation. I don't know. He tends to play to whatever crowd he's in front of. Um, he also sometimes says things aren't true to be self-protective. Um, he sometimes likes the way something else sounds better. And part of the problem with him, and I've, I've said this to people at my shop and, and in a lot of places over the last couple of years, you're often not really gonna know why he's doing something. Um, so for instance, there was a big thing the first year where people would be like, the tweets, that tweet is a distraction from this other thing. Sometimes, but sometimes it's just him popping off because he's upset about something. Or sometimes the tweet is planned with his director of digital you know, media. I mean, it's, it's not our digital operations. It's, you're often not gonna know. Um, and so at a certain point, I find there's not a huge utility in trying to find out why. And I just deal with what's in front of us, which is it's true or it's not true, which gets to your second question of why we don't say that. So our, our executive editor, Dean Becquet, um, does not want us to use the word lie. Um, you know, Does lie indicates intent. And in, it indicates intent and that it loses meaning. Uh, at a certain point if you use it constantly. And I I understand what he's saying. Um, I don't think we should tiptoe around saying that something isn't true if it's not true. Where I tend to fall on it is, you know, if, like, so for instance, Donald Trump claiming that Barack Obama was born in Kenya, that's a lie. And and the Times called it a lie, I think, on the front page. Um, after a while. After a, after it a while. It took a long time yeah, for after a while. To, to get there. Well, it was also <laughs> once Trump acknowledge that it was not true, right? Um, but I, I think that um, there, are, this is a, a part of a broader conversation where people will say to me, and I had it said to me earlier today, you know, if you guys were, can't you guys do some, it was some version of can't you, can't you find a way to make clear to people that what he's saying isn't true? Can't you, you know, call, if my saying it's not true doesn't make that clear to people, then I don't actually know what else will do it? And one of the things we've gotten it's become very clear, especially in such a diffuse era of media and partisan media, is people are able to choose their own adventure and pick which facts that they want at this point, and it becomes much harder. So I think we're navigating through that atmosphere too. Well, that gets, us to an, uh, gets me to another point. I mean, you guys have done amazing award-winning work. You've, you know, been hailed by the industry as you won the White House Correspondents Association Award, the Pulitzer, um, talking about everything from you know the ethical breaches and the administration, Russian interference, but it doesn't move the needle of public opinion very much. You know, people are still in their camps. Um, is that in any way dispiriting or discouraging to you? Not that you're writing to unseat the president, but to think that you've, you, you expose all of this information and people kind of, on, in certain camps, just sort of shrug at it or absolutely don't believe it. It's dispiriting when people don't believe it, but what they do with the information, I don't find, I mean, that's, that's up to them. I'm not, we're not, I, what I'm, I'm really emphatic about in this, in this era of partisanship is that the media should not be the tip of the spear for one political party or another. And we're not writing for that, we're writing for history and we're writing to document events and we're writing to show um, you know, uh, how the administration works and how the president has interacted with investigations into him and with his, with his, with his cabinet. And um, you know, I think that we've documented a really, all of us, the Washington Post has, uh, you know, NBC has, CNN has. Um, documented a, a pretty astonishing um, number of either abuses or acts of corruption or acts of criminality or acts of go on and on. It's up to voters to decide whether that matters to them or not. So um, you, you, documentation is just enough. Your your job. I is do. I, I the, that is our job, the, and I and I think we're doing it. Yeah. We're entering. Uh, we're, we're, it seems like 2020 presidential campaign season is in full. Oh, it's here. <laughs> in full uh, swing right now. Um, what did we learn from 2016? What, what will we do differently? What will, I don't know if you'll be on the campaign trail, if you'll still just be covering the White House, uh, although 
since this president is always in campaign mode, I guess that's the same thing. There's not going to be a big, <laughs> there's not going to be a big launch date. Exactly, I don't think exactly. I'm in a difference. Uh, what did we learn? What should we have learned? What should we be doing differently? I mean, the main, the main thing, the, the two main things I think about. One is that I think we are doing differently already. Is I think the, the main thing that st still stands out to me about 2016 was the. Um, the predictive journalism, the, the predictive data journalism. So 92% chance that Hillary Clinton wins. I don't, I don't think that that's served um, readers well at the end of the day. Uh, and I don't think we're gonna do that again. Um, I think we are still in a, you know, in a reflection process, all of us, not just at the Times, I think everywhere. I think we need to be mindful about headlines and what they say and, and uh, what, their, what impression they're giving and meaning, and what? meaning so for instance, um, you know, one of the ways to your question about conveying that this president says things that are not true, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of, part of the problem is, is that standard news process sometimes benefits him in this respect, right? In terms of getting out the misinformation because, you know, blah, 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 comma, President Trump says. Um, now, increasingly, you will see people write, President Trump falsely says. Because well, it's, it used to be, you know, you would, this would be said, and then people would keep reading, and they'd understand the difference. And I, so I think all of us just being mindful. Um, I think that you are seeing fewer networks taking his rallies live, and I think that that's actually going to be pretty important. Um, I think there's a recognition that the constant live broadcasts of his rallies um, might have served an entertainment purpose, but they they just spread, um, you know, things that he was saying without necessarily giving equal weight to the other side. Um, but in print, I mean, I think we're going to still have to figure out how his campaign relates to uh, his White House, and I don't quite know the answer to that yet. Interesting. All right. Let us uh, open it up for some questions. Thank you so much, Megan. Really Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. with questions. Um, wanna, we do have two microphones that, are, that will circulate. If you would raise your hand. Um, let's see, there's one here and one back there. Yeah, Candy Louie. Could you talk a little bit about his views uh, on foreign policy from Israel and Venezuela since they seem a little different? Well, I don't think I can say much you don't know, given <laughs> what you just said. Um, but uh, look, his views on foreign policy do not have any coherent line, which I think is what you're getting at. Um, and uh, I think that one of the questions that we have tried to ask, and in fact, I think Peter Baker and I did ask it, if I'm remembering correctly, in our interview with him in January, we tried getting it, even if we, I don't think we got quite as directly as we wanted to, but why there is such a line for Venezuela when there aren't for a lot of other countries, like, say, Russia. Um, so I can't explain it. Part of the problem with him during the campaign, I remember I did a foreign policy interview with the president, too, actually, with my colleague David Sanger. And if you listen to half the quotes, you would think he was an isolationist. And if you listen to the other half, you'd think he was an interventionist. And he tends to take both sides of the same issue, sometimes in the same sentence. And this is why when we would do these interviews, um, you know, again, sort of an example of news process benefiting him, news stories will just take a quote or two. You really need to read the whole transcript. And that's the only way you actually understand either the, co you know, what he's saying or the lack of cohesion. Um, I don't have a great answer for you. I think his, his views on Israel are, are, you know, in his mind resonant, not just with, his voting base and with evangelical voters, but also with Republican donors. And so I don't think it's a huge surprise. Um, I think on Venezuela, I think that is coming as much from his advisors as anything else. Does he have a foreign policy core at all? Or is there just, is there anything that he believes in? <laughs> I mean, he believes abjectly in strength. He also believes abjectly in getting the U.S. out of foreign entanglements. So it's can be really hard to marry those two. No, I mean I think that he it is situational at best. There's no doctrine. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, 
Hi. Um, so looking at President Trump as you know, one of the more accessible modern presidents uh, for the press, but also with very few press briefings, and then looking at past precedent, um, and seeing Trump as potentially either an anomaly or setting a new precedent, what would you prefer in the next president, you know, whether it's in 2020 or 2024? Um, would you rather have a president who kind of matches that being very available or someone who kind of goes back to sticking more to press briefings? It's a great question. Um, we don't, and, and with the, the caveat obviously being that we don't know what durable effect he's going to have. Uh, on how future presidents handle um, relations with the with the press corps, um, I think that it is personally. I have found interviewing help him helpful, and I think that I have. I think that a lot of people um, have liked being able to talk to him, even in just pool sprays when the reporters go in to the Oval Office for a few minutes, and then he takes questions, and that becomes an informal briefing. Not every reporter feels that way. Not every reporter is part of the press pool. Um, not every reporter has him calling and giving interviews. Not every outlet has that. Um, and the briefings really were where you would get to ask questions. And so, absent, I mean, that is, I think, a much more open and transparent system. This is very much on his terms. And I personally prefer the press briefings. But I don't prefer the press briefings if they're just turning into theater of yelling at each other uh, without actual facts, right, or without accurate facts. Um, I think that I think that the restoration of a of a useful press briefing would be a good thing. Hi, you talked about the constant pace and the toll that takes, and I'm wondering, do you think that across the industry is this the new normal? Is this sustainable? How do you think your job is going to look in the next five years? <laughs> Am I going to be alive in the next five years? Um, the, yes, it is the new normal. I don't know if it's sustainable. Um, I also don't think any president is going to keep up with this pace that President Trump does. Um, I don't, you know, if he's reelected, I don't know what we will all look like in six years. Um, I, look, I mean, the pace of all of this was increasing even before he got there. He has thrown accelerant on and on every aspect of everything, um, but Twitter was speeding up the cycle even before that blog. Before Twitter, blogs were speeding up the cycle. So uh, there was a while where long form made this very very impressive comeback, um, and it still exists in podcast form. I think that I think that fewer news outlets are doing long form than had been for a while, but I don't know what the next you know, remedy replica will look like. It's been about day to day and, and pacing. And again, back in the Stone Age when I was filing, you had a there was a you had a deadline. There was a time. Me too. You me filed, too. Yeah. Maybe twice a day yeah. at the very maybe, maybe, most. Maybe maybe three times. Maybe in three our case, times it was three times at the post. How often are you filing now? Oh, constantly. I mean, it's <laughs> we. You know, there are there are stories that get filed for the early web, and so those will go up either at five a.m. or at eight a.m. There are stories that get filed midday. There are stories that get filed later in the day. There are stories that get filed at night when news breaks at night. Um, there is news we pop on Twitter because it doesn't necessarily justify a story once I've spoken to editors. It's it's constant. It's constant. And, and what does that do for our ability to fact check when you are filing that frequently? I mean, the onus is still on us to be really careful. So we have to move with speed but also with precision. And... Um, it's uh, it's a lot. So, back to me. So this is kind of a two-part question. Um, so the first part would be, how do you deal with the plethora of information that we're dealing with in terms of news outlets? And then the second question, or the second part is, what it, what would you recommend for supplemental reading? That's an excellent question. Um, well, it's hard for me to say supplemental reading because I don't know what you actually read for your main diet, so I'd be guessing. Um, for myself, I still basically stick to the major news outlets because I know what I'm going to be getting. Um, I do check the Drudge Report pretty regularly. Oh, yeah. I do because he's a good aggregator of conservative media still. I mean, it's sort of amazing to me, his durability. Yeah. But 
Um, I mean, I re when I was at the New York Post, Matt Drudge would occasionally come to the newsroom and because he was doing a radio show for Murdoch. Um, and he's he is still very much in the fall. And, you know, he has a relationship with Jared Kushner. He's been in the White House. Um, so he's just got a good, he's a good one-stop shop. Um, but I still generally just read the, the time, get, or get most of my news from the Times, the Washington Post, um, NBC, CBS, CNN, uh, ABC. Um, uh, I, you know, Huffington Post still sometimes has some stuff that I want to read. Um, if you're interested in immigration reporting, Dara Lind at Vox is doing amazing work, um, like really amazing work, and understands it uh, with a level of nuance that most reporters don't. Um, the LA Times has actually had a resurgence recently, which makes me very happy. Um, yeah, one of my one of my former uh, New York colleagues, Michael Finnegan, has been at the LA Times for 20 years, and he's been doing amazing work on the Michael Avenatti case for the last several months. Um, I mean, my main my main recommendation would be just less Twitter, more actual reading of stories. That's a good recommendation overall. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, I know that you, or I watched The Fourth Estate, and it seemed as though uh, you had a very unique relationship with the okay, president. I couldn't find you for a second. Oh, sorry. sorry. That was Hi. very disorienting. Okay. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to uh, whether or not you feel an obligation with that relationship to not maybe cross a line of a journalist to more of a friend or a or a colleague of sorts, um, and how you manage that sort of closer relationship that many journalists have had the privilege of having with him. I think many people make assumptions, and your question indicates that you're one of them, um, about um, about my quote unquote relationship with him or um, and what that means for coverage. So um, I'm, um, I am not Donald Trump's friend, and I'm certainly not his colleague. So. I'm a journalist covering him. Um, I'm also a journalist who's been attacked by him. And I'm a journalist who has broken some uh, stories that he has despised, um, one of which he, just as a for instance, where I asked him directly in the Oval Office in January of this year if he had authorized General Kelly to get Jared Kushner a security clearance, and he told me no. I didn't just ask that for fun, I asked that because I had been chasing a story about this for weeks and was stymied, and actually thought he was just gonna say that he had done it. Um, so when he denied it, I was quite surprised. Um, and then it took several more weeks until we could confirm it. So, I mean, I guess I, I say this politely, but I reject the premise of that question. Um, back here. You use the word resurgence, and I've been thinking a lot about this, like. Every day I feel more and more compelled to wake up and go to my political reporting class. And in this era of very, very scary rhetoric, do you think that there's a silver lining, especially for the next generation of political reporters? I don't know how to answer that. Um, look, I think this is actually a great time to be a political reporter. It's not a great time for the industry, just in terms of crackdowns. What the president says with his rhetoric is very dangerous. Um, but uh, but I think in terms of political reporting, there there are a ton of opportunities. Um, it's just it's just a difficult job, um, and it means that you are going to. One of the things that the president does is he turns everybody around him into part of the story, and that's very difficult for the press because we're not supposed to be part of the story. Um, so I think there are a lot of people who see him attacking media and don't want to become a part of that. Um, I think that it feels so partisan that it's hard to figure out sort of what the actual pathway is. I do think that this era of partisanship, I mean, it started before him. Um, he has, as I said, thrown accelerant on it, on everything uh, that included. I don't think that's gonna abate anytime soon. So I think that um, if, if you have concerns about being in that arena, I'm not sure that that's gonna get better, but I can't advocate strongly enough for trying to be a political reporter right now. So one of the things I lament about what's happened to political reporting is that political reporting now gets, people assume political reporting means national political reporting. That's, we have that's lost right. a lot of local political yes. report. Yes. That, that formative work that you did as a city hall reporter is not being done in a lot of places 
even at the New York Times and the Washington Post, which have no totally abandoned that for the national reporting. No question. I think the Washington Post, I think, is actually still doing some they're getting pretty better. good. Uh, yeah, they're, do, they're getting better. But, you know, look at the reporting at the Baltimore Sun yeah. recently about their mayor, for instance. Um, look at um, that, that, is a, that is a testament to local reporting. I mean, I agree with you. And I, I think I said earlier, I don't think that we or anyone is covering New York the way we had been. Um, it's, it's an incredible loss. Local journalism is, is vital and essential to, to, to a functional democracy in this country, and I worry about it all the time. What, what story do you think is out there but is being ignored that's really important? It's a great question, and I don't know if I think it's one story in particular. I think that there are vast... Uh, areas of reporting that need to be getting more attention. I think that what's happening at the Department of Education uh, is not getting anywhere near enough attention. I think what's happening at the EPA is not getting near enough attention. My concern about reporting in the era of Trump is we spend so much time on sort of his daily, you know, whatever, the churn, um, and it obscures a lot of what is going on underneath. And I think there are a lot of his advisors in the White House who do have clearer doctrines or policy agendas who are aware that we are all sort of distracted chasing a shiny object. Um, you know, there was some terrific reporting, I think it was by ProPublica, a couple, of, and they are doing great work in terms of partnering with local yes. outlets in particular. Um, but they had done a story about, you know, sort of Trump's crew of friends from Mar-a-Lago um, advising him on, on the VA and what that led to. And that was just incredible work. So one has to assume that that's probably not the only agency where that's going, that type of thing is going on. And I wish that we had, we all had more uh, work invested in those areas. Hi. Hi. So uh, thanks for the good work you do. Thanks. Keep it up. Thanks for being here. Uh, what do you think or understand Russia has over the current occupants of the White House? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I can't really answer that question. Um, I, I know that there's a lot of speculation about the president and his approach to Russia. Um, I, I, I can't... What are the I, chances I, we'll get the tax returns? Um, I think they're slim. Um, because I think that... Uh, uh, I think that the, the people who would be making the decision um, are political, uh, political appointees. Sorry for not really answering your question, but I'm not really going to answer your question. Hi. Um, you mentioned the problems with predictive data journalism that really showed themselves in 2016, um, but midterm election coverage still featured live polls and the, the infamous needle. And I'm wondering where you see the value of prediction and polls in 2020 election coverage. Really good question. Um, so I do. I think polling is very important. I do, um, but I think it just depends on how it's used. And I think polling tells us where voters' energy is. So, for instance, most of the polling in 2018 showed that voters were incredibly uh, invested in uh, which party would be better on health care. And yeah, and that was and that was that was what the election turned on in large part. Not only um, immigration also factored into a lot of votes in the suburbs, but it was. Healthcare was a major focal point, and we knew that because of polling. Polling is just a snapshot, right? It's a moment in time. It's not a it's not a crystal ball. And so I think that um, we all need to be rigorous and mindful of not over interpreting it, both about issues and also about candidates and where they stand, especially in a in the Democratic field that at the moment I think has eighteen candidates. Uh, it's more than the than the Republicans had in twenty sixteen. So I just. You know, somebody made the point on Twitter today, I think it was Dave Weigel, that, you know, so people are looking, Mom. what's that? Oh, I did not know that. Um, that uh, but he made a great point that, you know, people are looking at a, a poll of Iowa and saying, wow, Biden's got strength because he's at 27%. And Dave looks at that and says there's 73% who are still open to shopping around. He's right. Um, you know, Biden has 100% name recognition. So I think I just, look, this, this question about polls and how we all do with them and how accurate they are, has, been, has existed since I've been a political reporter. Um, it just was more acute in 2016 for a variety of reasons, um, but it is a conversation we're all having. 
you mentioned how the press was chasing a shiny object and the other issues that you thought it may or may not have neglected. Um, how do you feel that the conclusion of the Mueller investigation will change coverage or will change your role at all? And um, do you think that, like, in a w like, what was the reaction in the newsroom to that? And is it an opportunity to move to other topics? Um, so we still haven't seen the report. So I don't actually know what's in the report. And until I know what's in the report, I don't have much of a reaction. Um, I know what Barr says is in the report. And as we reported, uh, as my colleagues, um, uh, Nick Fandos, Mike Schmidt, and Mark Mazzetti reported that uh, some members of the Mueller team felt that Barr had mischaracterized their findings. So I'm gonna wait and see what this looks like. After that, I don't know, but I mean, it's not, this this phase of it doesn't end with the Mueller report um, because Congress is going still going to be looking at the president on all manner of things. We're also going to be making an effort to try to get the underlying material for the Mueller report. So um, I, I don't think this, this phase of it's ending. But to his question, the first part of his question, mm -hmm. Did we overplay the Mueller report? I mean, was our emphasis, we were covering it without knowing what Mueller was so good at not letting us know entirely what was going on, that it felt as though we whipped the public into a frenzy uh, of hope or expectation about what that would, what that, when that landed, it, right. it would land with this great, it would be this great revelation. Where I think that we, well, so for one thing, I don't think it was gonna be a great revelation because there was so much real time reporting on what was gonna be in it, number one. Where I think that we all could have done a much better job to the first part of your question um, is, I think there were a lot of people who literally believed this was gonna end with the president getting frog marched out of the Oval Office. And that was, that was never gonna happen. Um, and I think we also should have done a better job, frankly, at making clear a while ago that this report might not ever be delivered in full to Congress. This was not yeah. gonna be a star report. And part of the reason there was not gonna be a star report is that the Democrats changed the rules after star because they felt star had gone so overboard in trying to embarrass for political ends. Um, when Bill Barr in his Senate confirmation hearing said it might not be a report to Congress, it might just be a summary, um, you know, members of the, the president's legal team were very happy that that had been said. And I think that it was a moment where I remember thinking we all really should have been doing more to make this clear to people. And yeah, so I that I think was the biggest problem. Hi again. So as, as a fan and a junkie of your work, I, I could be listening to these questions and geeking <laughs> out. Um, but I want to ask you a, a couple of, of like more about you and the work. What what brings you joy in, in, in this work? What, where do question. you find you always ask people that. <laughs> where do you find satisfaction? And then I'm borrowing from a from it was texted to me. Um, how are you taking care of yourself in, in the work? Um, I mean, I haven't been I haven't been to the gym in six months, so that should answer that question. Um, I um, I getting a scoop brings me joy. Writing a story that's accurate brings me joy. Beating the competition still really brings me joy. And so this is I, still. I mean that that is that was what I got addicted to at the post very early, twenty three years ago was was beating the competition. And it's still knowing we have a story that others don't have is still at the end of the day. And knowing that we are knowing that we and it's not just any story. I mean something that I think is informative and that tells people something about this presidency that they would not have known otherwise. Um, Two examples of that recently would have been stories that I, I was very satisfied with were we had a very large read about the president and obstruction and this top of the story was about him asking the acting attorney general whether someone who the president perceived as more friendly to him could be put in charge of the Michael Cohen probe. Um, and then the second one was about the Kushner clearances. So those were stories that people would not have known if we did not report them. I read somewhere that you used to sing. Oh, no, I still sing. Oh, yeah, I was supposed to say, do you still sing? Yeah. Do, do you find not joy in, in that? No, not <laughs> Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do. do you? I do, yeah. Do I, and I find joy in being with my children. I mean, I find joy in, I find joy in hanging out with my daughter. I find joy in talking to my, my sons. Um, I find joy in seeing my husband when I see him. Um, you know, I, also a journalist. Who's also a journalist. <laughs> um, and also covers politics. Um, but... Uh, 
I, I have I have a lot in my life that makes me very happy. Um, so you talked about this kind of like regression in the coverage of local news and local politics. Um, so I was wondering if, in your opinion, how this has changed or affected the way that we now engage with national news and politics. It's a great question, and I wish it was a regression. I think it's actually a, a permanent break because it's all based on advertising dollars and attrition. Um, Look, I think it has made national news more important, but national news can't fill the void of local reporting. Uh, we're not in these communities. We're not, uh, we're not covering state houses. I mean, this is how corruption thrives, is when people are not covering it. Um, what In an ideal world, it would make national news more focused on certain aspects of local coverage, but I think we're all still figuring that out. And I think that's where ProPublica has a very good model of partnering with local uh, outlets that don't quite have the same level of resources that they used to, um, but I don't know where it's going. I, um, I'm oh, over sorry, here. no, Tony, go ahead. Okay, Maggie, I'm over here. <laughs> um, I, can you comment on Melania? And and where I'm going there is, well, relative to is she underreported? Is she? It, does she have a platform? It, and and I guess my finale is, what, do you see her campaigning? Um, uh, in 2020, do you see her being uh, uh, an influencer or, or still uh, just take it from there? Um, I th <laughs> okay. Um, I think that she is a very private person who has never liked this, who I think did not want him to run for president, who did not want to be, you know, a political spouse in the way that we have come to define it in this country in presidential elections in particular. I am sure that we will see her out on the trail in some fashion in 2020, but I think that her main focus is their son and, and always has been. And one thing that I will say for the National Press Corps, for all of the, for all of the, the hostility that the president lobs, the Press Corps has been very good about pre being respectful about the privacy of, of Barron. And I've been very pleasantly surprised by that. Yeah. Um, the uh, especially after you saw like Chelsea Clinton in the White House just get eviscerated by the national press um, in a way that I think that was I have to I can't imagine growing up like that and being a teenager with that. Um, but I don't I think that she has certain initiatives she wants to work on Melania Trump. I think that you know she rolled out this Be Best initiative. I think it's obviously struggled to figure out exactly what it is. But um, I don't think she uses the she does not use the first ladies platform in the way we are used to seeing first ladies use it. And I think a lot of that is just a byproduct of the fact that this is not the life she picked for herself. Hi, what aspects of the Trump presidency are you surprised have not been covered in more depth by other outlets? I don't know how to answer that. Um, there really isn't any aspect of it that I think has gone uncovered per se. I just think that there's areas where I would like to see more coverage, as I mentioned earlier. But I generally think across the board the coverage has been has been pretty th thorough. It just has not. Well, actually, it's not thorough. It's been broad. Um, there are areas where I wish it was deeper. Hi. Um, as you you know, you've mentioned that you'd like to see more of the local news coverage, but there's been so many news outlets that are closing and haven't really been able to find a viable business model in this new digital age. How do you think about sort of the sustainability of national news, local news in this like transition to digital, which is a lot harder to make revenue? I don't have deep thoughts on that because frankly, this is that's an area of the business that I'm really not particularly involved in, and it's probably for the better that reporters are not involved in that aspect. Um, I think that it is becoming harder and harder for outlets to exist without some deep-pocketed benefactor. So in the case of the Washington Post, it's Bezos. Um, you know, the other option is that then you have news outlets, local news outlets that are bought by hedge funds. Um, and I think that's very problematic. Uh, so... I don't have a great answer in terms of sustainability, and I think that no one does, which is why this product is kind of reinventing itself every few years right now in the digital age. But if you were a young person starting out today, or what advice would you give to a young? Because local news used to be where we started, right? Yeah, no, we it, that. I mean, my advice now, when I when I speak at, I, I spoke at Chatham um, uh, several days ago, and I had a ton of 
uh, students come up to me literally and just say, how do I get a job at this point? And the answer is, you know, what that I gave them, and I, I stand by it, is, you know, go to D.C. St stay, or stay in Chicago. Chicago is, is you know, if you're here. Um, or go to New York. But there actually are a lot of jobs there. You just have to be prepared to take a job that you might not necessarily think is what you want to be doing. Um, I didn't necessarily want to be a copy kid for two years, but I did do that for two years. Um, I think that the level of reporting that people are doing at a pretty young age is never would have occurred to been possible when I was young. So, I mean, you do have opportunities that you didn't have before. Um, but the jobs are now at a national level, and they are really all digital platforms in New York or D.C. And some of that is around this presidency. I mean, Trump, one of Trump's things is constantly saying that he's been good for business. That's not wrong. Um, and I do wonder what happens when he goes. When he goes. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm curious about your writing process. So after you've gathered all of the facts and all your hard reporting that you do, what do you actually do when you write? Like, do you have an outline? Do you outline it in your head? And has it evolved over time? I wish that my process had evolved over time. Um, the, uh, um, one of the painful realities for me of the fact that I studied fiction in college is that, um, you know, I learned the hard way that if you don't learn, for those of you who are actually studying journalism, learn how to write a news story. If you do not learn it early, you're never gonna totally get it. And it will just, it will be a second language to you. Um, if not forever, then for a long time. Um, I tend to talk it out with a colleague or an editor, and then I will make some loose outline, you know, thoughts uh, in print. And then I go from there. And, <sighs> You know, it just depends on how much time I have to write a story. Some of these stories take a very long time. That one about obstruction that I was talking about took a very long time. The clearance is one actually, um, a draft of it had sat around for weeks because we thought it was, we, this was when we were trying to confirm it and couldn't. And then when we did confirm it, it looked pretty different once we were done with it. Um, it just really depends on the story. What? from your fiction writing background, have you been able to incorporate in your journalism? I got asked this question by the students earlier and the answer is literally nothing. Um, so it's just, they are, they are, for me, they are such different muscles that I can't, I don't write fiction anymore. I haven't written fiction in 20 years because it's, once it was all news writing, that was where all my energy went to and my reporting muscle is far more developed. Sorry. Um, so you said before that your role as a reporter at the Times is to write for history, and I was wondering if you think, if you see a tension between writing for posterity versus writing to inform the public now, or if you see those as compatible. I think they're. I think they're compatible. I mean, I think that. I think, and I think that both are the goals. I mean, I think that my point was less. I don't think it is just first draft of history, although that is certainly a part of it. Um, we're obviously writing to inform the public, or else it wouldn't be a daily newspaper. Um, what I was drawing the distinction from was doing that versus trying to, you know, use news copy to affect an outcome. Um, because, you know, people are pretty dug in on their views, and so all we can do is just keep reporting the truth. I'm wondering if you're able to speak on 2020 from the Democratic side. Are, are there any candidates that are really standing out to you? Um, and if so, why? What I always say to everybody when they ask that is I'm not falling for that again after 2016. <laughs> um, I, um, I think that it is way too early. Um, I think it's way too early and I don't think we've seen the last of who is gonna get in. I, I think until Joe Biden, I think, oh, I, I think there could be some strength. I think, I think Terry McAuliffe might get in. I don't necessarily think he has a clear path, but I, you know, I, Joe Biden's not actually in yet, right? I mean, yeah. so. Let's just wait and see what happens. We have time for maybe two more questions, so make them good. Hi. <laughs> you can make them bad, it's okay. Uh, I have two questions, so. <laughs> no, 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 you don't, you, don't, you don't get to do that. No, go, go okay, uh, so my first question is that you said uh, it took you a while to confirm the clearance story. Uh, so my question is, is there ever a point that you let go of a story because it's taking you too long to confirm? 
uh, especially given the current administration. And my second question is, I did listen to the daily podcast, and I wanted to know what was, how did you prepare for that interview, and what was what was going on in your mind going into the White House? You mean the interview with the president? Yeah, oh, the publisher so, and the president. Okay, so in terms of whether we let a story go, it's it's an excellent question. Um, and I thought we were going to have to let the clearances story go because we were just at a at a wall, and then we suddenly had a breakthrough. But um, but it was driving me crazy. I mean, I was obsessed with this story. What for, level of confirmation do you have to have to to go? I can't get I can't get into the details, but yeah. it was it was it was a million times solid. Like there was no, and and we needed to be yeah, you know sure. yes. a million percent solid on it. Um, but it was it was making me crazy, and we had been I had been it had been the focus of most of my reporting energy for two and a half months by the time we did it. Um, in terms of the interview with the president, um, we did what we always do, which is we start a Google Doc of um, questions, and you know, and we solicit from a bunch of different departments in the paper, and you know, invariably it gets shrunk down. I think we had eighty-one questions <laughs> at one point. Um, and then I will go through my list of what I must ask, and then it's and if we have time for X, Y, Z, um, and then there is always some question that I wish I had asked. And in that case, it was the second I like I remember my foot falling back into the bureau when we were done, and I realized I had not asked him whether the public had a right to see the Mueller report, which is what I had wanted to ask. And I, it, in a sense, it doesn't matter because he has given like four different answers about that since then. Um, but uh, but. But and many of them have conflicted. Um, but th that's how we prepared. And our, our last question is this gentleman right here. Um, so you were talking a lot about the you know the consistent reporting that you have to do. You know you're constantly having to update stories and uh, you know stuff's breaking so quickly. Do you think it ever gets you know just a little overwhelming? You know you think I think about Brexit particularly and like the people in Britain are just so fed up with it. And again, there's just another you know extension on it. Is it just at a certain point, tuning people out, and they're just kind of like, yeah, I'm done with this. Do you mean that people are tuning our coverage out? Is that what I, you mean? Uh, but, you know, they just, they don't want the updates anymore. They're just tired of hearing about I, I think people feel that way about Mueller, and I think that some people feel that way about the president. I mean, I do think that there is a fatigue um, that has set in. I mean, I will say that, again, I, I don't I don't regret the, the energy we have put on the, the Mueller probe because I think it's important. Um, uh, both historically and in terms of informing the public, but I do, I do think that the disconnect between that and what voters voted on in 2018 is informative um, and something to bear in mind going forward. Um, look, I, you know, I talk to a lot of voters who sort of have fatigue from the news, but most of them are not the president's supporters. When I spent 2018 in the Deep South, you know, he was he 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 had hero status, um, and it was really amazing the bond that not just evangelical voters, but but Southern voters who weren't necessarily evangelical, had to this this thrice divorced billionaire from Fifth Avenue. Um, can I have to ask how much of that is tribal? I mean, a lot of it is. I mean, most of it is, and I think. But in in the case in his in this case with him, I think in twenty sixteen, Mike Pence was a proxy for him. He was a validator. And I think now a lot of these voters feel like they have a bond with him. They believe that he has kept their promises. Whether he has or hasn't, that's what they think. And so, um, and I spoke to a lot of voters in in the South who, you know, felt as if the tax cut had been helpful to them, for instance. Um, it's not necessarily the view on the coasts, but it was the view there. Um, and it is tribal, but it's, the result is the same. Yeah. Maggie Herman, thank you so much. This thank you. I appreciate it. Really, thank you. Good job. Um, thank you all. I want to thank I, I want to thank Charles Whitaker and, and Medill. I want to thank uh, Maggie Haberman. I feel like um, there may be fatigue with all of these stories, but in this room, there's no fatigue to hearing you talk about your work. And um, I want to thank you all for being here, and look forward to seeing you the next time. Thank you. Thank you.